thinking ahead past this pandemic when we're back to holding events, I'm wondering if a good auctioneer is the way to go. Our nonprofit doesn't have the capacity yet to partner with a paid professional auctioneer. Are live auctions even worth it? Gosh, do you remember the days of live events, Andy? Does that feel like a century ago? I don't miss them. <laughs> I, it's interesting. I don't miss them too much either. And I will share that I've been to a couple of virtual galas recently that were done really well. And I thought, cool, I, I get to be in my pajamas, hanging out on my couch, <laughs> so, enjoying the entertainment. So uh, anyway, I, I'm sure you and I may be um, rare because I think some people, I mean, I know a lot of people don't love these things, but some people really really love these live events. So uh, anyway, so I think, I mean, there's obviously two key things to whether it's worth it, right? Can you get the audience uh, that you want in the room that can bid on the packages and can you get the packages? And so I, I feel like it's less about the auctioneer and more about, I mean, yes, a, a good auctioneer, if you have the right audience and you have the right kinds of items, can be phenomenal and really help kind of get the crowd engaged and excited and get them kind of competing with each other. But when you think about this from a standpoint of if you don't have the, the right items or you don't have the right audience, that auctioneer can't work magic. What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I'm not really sure because the, you're right that the, the the, the items need to be significant enough that you're 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 going to pay for the services of the auctioneer in order to get them up to a certain dollar amount right you have to kind of pay for it so if you can't get the items to be able to pay for the auctioneer then i mean just from a straight financial perspective i would see and like can't are we capable of getting items that are expensive enough that the auctioneer is going to be worth it because silent auctions are they people behave with a silent auction differently than they behave with a live auction, right? So the silent auction people are going for, I'm going to get this for the cheapest price that I could get it. That's what they walk in with. They're not, nobody just goes in and throws the top bid at it. Um, whereas a live auction, I think I was at, I was in a, at an event not that long ago, actually it was just right after the pandemic started and we were shocked that it still went on. And there were a lot of people in that room, uh, which was terrifying. But um the, but it was the kind of thing where the live auction items were so absurd. It was like, you know, somebody's vacation home in the Canary Islands for like a month. And it's also like a palace, <laughs> you know, but that was the, those were the people that were in the room. And that's the kind of thing that would, uh, it would be lost on a silent auction table. It has to be pointed out to an entire room full of very wealthy people for that one to even go for close to what it's worth. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, it really depends on what you, what you're capable of getting. If, if you're going to be able to get those things, sure. A, a, a professional auctioneer is probably the way to go. If you're not going to get those things, I mean, I don't know that I would ever go with a non-professional auctioneer. Um, like the local weather guy or whatever. I've seen that. I don't know that that's ever a smart idea. Yeah, I actually think there's a lot lost I, 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 when you do that. And uh, I will, my, my husband will forgive me for this, but he's, you know, part of a, a, a board of, of a really tiny grassroots little nonprofit, you know, all volunteer organization. And one year they decided to you know, do their own live auction and, and everything they did with it was, was a bit comical for those of us who've gone to more professional auctions, right? I mean, there was way too many items. I think it was 25 items. So it was a, a three hour experience and, and my husband stood up and he was the auctioneer and, and, you know, he did as good a job as he could, but it's, it's, it's a skill. I mean, auctioneering is a skill. So I think first and foremost, if, if you do a live auction, uh, I do think investing in someone who's a professional and has, uh, there's also a lot of different personalities and styles out there. I've seen a lot of professionals that some really, uh, can rub the audience the wrong way. So they may be a professional, but they're, they're too aggressive. So, so I think doing some homework on that. The other thing to keep in mind is I, I, I'm reflecting back on the, the Great Recession so many years ago. Um, and when I would sit in the room that did have the, the audience who was capable of, of 
bidding on these auction items and the auction items were amazing. It still really got pretty silent and uncomfortable during the live auction period. And, and some of those amazing donations or donated live auction items went for not half of what they were worth. And I remember thinking how upset those donors probably felt that it didn't and, and almost offended or insulted that their item didn't go for quite that much. And it's really uncomfortable being in the audience when that happens. So when I think about what's going on right now with the pandemic and knowing that live events for the most part are still a ways away and, and not knowing exactly where our economy is going to be at that point. I, I just, I, my gut is saying, I think it's worth sort of steering clear of this for, for maybe a few years. Uh, but, but it's hard, it's hard not knowing, you know, I don't know the person who wrote this question, their background, the size of their organization or, or anything like that. So I'm wondering like if, if there's actually going to be the opposite, if there's going to be pent up demand for these because people are so tired of not being able to do that kind of thing, that, that the opportunity for a night out and some free signature cocktails, or at least one free signature cocktail and then drink tickets um, is, is going to be a draw to people. I know, I mean, it's me personally, I'm going the other direction. The, the longer this goes on, the less likely I want to be in the room with anybody anywhere, <laughs> becoming more and more of a hermit. So, so I don't know. I mean, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe people are taking it a different way than I am. So it'd be interesting to see though. <laughs> it will be really interesting to see. And, and I also think sadly, there's just, I, I don't know if you've heard of this, Andy, but I've talked to so many nonprofits that have postponed their, their galas because they are very much dependent on their, their fundraising events. And they are all going to hit it once, at least if from what I hear, like, I think everything then it's going to be an event every night of the week for four months. So, so then that also leads to the point of, will it be oversaturation, even for those who are excited to get back into this event mode and attend these events, there's only so many and so big your budget is. So, so it definitely will be interesting. We'll have to do a revisit of this when the time comes. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurick and Stacy Wedding. Today's podcast is sponsored by Immunize Nevada. Arm yourself by getting your annual flu vaccine. It protects you, your family, and those working on the front lines. Do your part. Get your flu vaccine by Nevada Day. Visit nvflufighter.org for more information and to find free and low-cost clinics. Andy, is it legal for a board to require that all of its board members be limited to a specific ethnic group even if the services our nonprofit offers are open to anyone of any background? Oh, fraught. It is fraught. The answer is yes. Is it legal for a board to require that all of its board members be limited to a specific ethnic group? There's nothing that prohibits that. So to answer the question, the IRS is not going to stop you. The attorney general is not going to stop you. Um, so, so, but remember that something being legal a lot of times is is the absolute minimum of the requirement. So um, I'm just I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that um, so that a, a white male answering a question about diversity is ridiculous. So with that <laughs> out of the way, um, my question would be more about is it does it make sense for this organization? Like, is there a legitimate reason for this organization to have a single ethnic group represent 100% of the board? Um, I, I, I can think of cases where that would be totally appropriate. I mean, certainly we can say that um, when we look at the entire population of nonprofit boards across the United States, that they are overwhelmingly white, they're overwhelmingly aged, <laughs> They are, right, they are overwhelmingly made up of people with money. Um, they are probably overwhelmingly heterosexual. 
so there's lots of lots of different categories. Like when you talk about board diversity, there are lots of categories to diversity other than just, for example, the ones that people think up first, which are race and gender. So so there are lots of these different diversity categories that you can consider, and you need to make a an a like an important distinction as a board of what is the most important thing from a diversity standpoint for your board like disability there's there's a category so how important is it for your board to have somebody on it that that has a disability how important is it for your board to have somebody on it that is not heterosexual so so where do you draw the line what kind of board do you want to put together and and in many cases it probably should have something to do with the the types of categories of people that your nonprofit is serving but i don't know that that's a requirement anywhere i i don't know either if there's a, that's a requirement what, what i think it would be more interesting for this organization not knowing anything about their mission who they serve all of the questions that could influence the answer to this, but but I'm thinking about the fact that you could create something that isn't a restriction. It's the restriction part of this question that's bugging me, right? A requirement that all board members be X, Y, Z ethnic group. That That feels so constraining and restrictive to me. And yes, it could make sense in certain circumstances, but but really, like, I mean, in, in a world where we're trying to look at people that maybe come to the table with a completely different perspective or different uh, background, I mean, do we have to require that? Or can we instead say that's a preference or put together a lot of boards put together a policy in their, you know, recruitment tools? They put together a policy that talks a bit about what percentage of board members they want to meet X such criteria. So if it's really important to have that lived experience or, or, or that representation, you can do it like that without restricting and limiting it. This just feels so like, like you've got handcuffs on and it just doesn't feel comfortable to me. So I, th I, mean, I, I agree. And I, I think that we would all, acknowledge that the reason that you want a highly diverse board in every category of diversity is that then you get lots of different perspectives, you're much more creative, and you're much more likely to be able to understand your constituents in, in a way that they understand themselves because they're going to be they're going to be cultural cultural things that are important that make sense to a board member that's going to also be important and make sense to a constituent. And so if you're if you're reaching out to a whole bunch of a whole variety of constituents if you've got the whole gamut of constituents then having a board that's all a single ethnic group they're all one group they may not be able to understand the needs of those other constituents quite as well. So so that is, I think that's totally acknowledged, and I think everybody would agree with that. I think where where I would like to go, which is probably less, they're going to get fewer people agreeing with this, is that when we look at, again, the population of nonprofits throughout the United States, they're overwhelmingly run and managed by white people. If we're just talking about, because ethnicity was the piece that came up in this in this particular question. So they're overwhelmingly run by white people. And we know, what are the things that we know just by looking at historical studies of things that work? When you are hiring somebody, people in general hire people with characteristics that are very similar to themselves. So unless you are intentionally thinking, I must get out of this rut, you're just gonna feel more comfortable with somebody that looks like you. You're gonna feel more comfortable with somebody that has the exact same cultural background as you. So if an organization is overwhelmingly white, they're much more likely to have a white CEO. They're much more likely to have an entirely white staff, right? Which, so you get this sort of mono monoculture of people that are only thinking about one thing, which when we talk about it as a, like if you ask, answer the, ask the question, if, if everybody on the board was white and the requirement for the board was that everybody on the board be white, first of all, that's absurd, right? We would never, we would, we would be answering this question differently, right? 
Yes. And the reason yes. that it's difficult to answer the question in other ways is because that is clearly not right. And the reason that's not right is because then you're going to end up with an all white organization and we've already got enough of those. Oh. So, so if it's the, if it's something different, if this, if the board has a rule that they are all going to be black and that that's the requirement is that everybody on that board needs to be black. That is means that more likely the executive director is going to be black and more of the staff are going to be black, which in the population of nonprofits throughout the United States is something that's relatively rare and something that probably needs to happen in order to be able to reach all of the constituents, right? So having a, a single board that is a perfect microcosm of the constituents that they're serving is going to be very, very difficult to do. There just aren't enough people with the set of characteristics that are required to be able to exactly match your exactly set of characteristics for the constituents. So you're going to need to have organizations that may be overwhelmingly of one ethnic group and other ones that are overwhelmingly of one, one gender identity or overwhelmingly of something else, right? So those, those are going to be okay in the population of nonprofits throughout the United States in order to, number one, deal with things like systemic racism, number two, be able to reach constituents that are in really weird corners of <laughs> edge cases of, you know, people that you just didn't think would exist with this, category, this set of categories, right? The only way that that's ever going to happen is to be able to have these, these boards that may not be this, you know, your, your platonic ideal of the diverse board. You, you raise a really, though, your point is really, it's striking me from a standpoint of, it, I might feel differently or answer this question differently if it was saying that its services and programs were restricted to a certain population type or racial group or, you know, whatever, a different ethnic, like a specific ethnic background. I, I might feel differently and answer this differently. I think what's really not sitting with me is the fact that I can't imagine that any ethnic group, like limiting the board membership to any ethnic group when you're serving anyone from any background makes sense. I, I don't care what ethnic group. It just, it, to me, it just kind of goes counter to everything of what a public charity <laughs> and a public, right, you know, serving the general public being governed by the general public, like so I, I, to me, it just it just it sort of like goes it, it pushes that up against the wall, and it just is it feels wrong. So um, you know that's not a legal opinion, that's a Stacy opinion, but it just it feels like it's just not practical and prudent if you really want to serve people the best uh, in the best light. So so I, it's an interesting. I mean, these issues I think are not unique to the person who wrote this. And I also am thinking of caveats, Andy, like I'm thinking of, I'm, I really looked at this question thinking about it from more of a 501c3 public charity perspective, but think about how many membership organizations, right, which are nonprofits in their own right, but with different tax status, but think about how many membership organizations out, are out there that are exclusively for, organized for and about and run by a specific group of people. And, and in that situation, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, I'm thinking about like NABO, the National Association of Women Business Owners. Okay, so I'm going to guess, I'm just going to make an assumption without looking that all of their board members are women or female business owners. And that mm -hmm. that's probably who they're serving. I guess it goes back again to the mission and how the mission's written. But, you know, is it written that you're trying to, you know, that you have to, that's a requirement? Or is it written in a way that you're there to promote uh, in that specific example, like a female entrepreneur. And so you could technically then have, you know, men promoting female entrepreneurship, I mean, just as easily, but, but I guess I'm just, I'm just sort of thinking it, it's so hard to answer this without more specifics. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's, I still think I, I agree with you. I, I, I understand what you're saying too. And, but I still believe that un, until we get to a point where, this question is boring. Like if somebody asked the question, like, like, I mean, it, 
un- until it's not something that's a fraught question anymore that we don't have to worry about when you look at the general, if you pick just a sample of boards and you're going to say, I guarantee you by picking this sample of boards that 85% of the board members are going to be white. Like oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's going to be the case. And until that's no longer the case, I think it's perfectly okay for an organization to say, we want to make sure that we have this level of representation. And as, if we're not going to be brought on on these other boards, which are, which we're not going to be brought on, then, then we're going to make sure that we're going to try to make sure that the, the population of, of ethnicity board members is, is getting a little better over the, over the long run. So yeah. you, like, I remember yeah. it's like, like, it reminds me of like chemistry class, right? So it, back in chemistry class in high school, which I was terrible at for some reason, and I blame my chemistry teacher, um, the, because it's probably not that hard, honestly. Oh, oh. <laughs> is hard Andy come on <laughs> but there is this there's this concept of 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 a solution right so you've got yes. water and you pour salt in the water and the, if you at some point like the the proportion of salt in the water is a certain amount regardless of whether or not it's been stirred properly like and and so what I'm saying is is that okay like to me, it feels like that's probably okay. If we're going to continue to pour salt in the water to make the proportion of salt higher, is it okay that we haven't stirred it yet? And I think with the understanding that, you know, my, my initial point, which was that I think everyone would agree that having a diversity of viewpoints on every board is going to be better for the organization as a whole. I think everybody would agree with that statement. But I think my... my um, my probably more aggressive statement is I'm cool with pouring in more salt, even if it's not stirred up yet. Interesting. No. And I, it's, I finally am having an aha moment. I think it took me a while. I'm, I'm consider me asleep at the wheel, but I, I think I just dawned on me what you're saying. Like it ultimately, and I'm going to just, I'm going to talk about this from a not chemistry perspective because the minute you said <laughs> chemistry, literally I shut down, my brain shut down. So <laughs> none of that really just worked for me. Okay. But, but, but here's the thing. I mean, at the end of the day, yes. Like, I mean, there's been so much, um, I mean, to some degree oppression of certain groups and just, you know, di- discrimination, whether realized or not, you know, a by unconscious bias that's happened over the years that, that yes, if you have a certain ethnic group, that that base you know in a certain group of people that says this guess what we're fighting back because we're not represented on any of these other organizations we get to create our own rules now because no one's doing this for us i i think in essence that's I, that's my layman's way of saying what you just said correct yes yes okay so yes i am fully i fully support that if it, it's not I mean, in, in Stacy's Pollyanna world, it's it's still not perfect because I really just want everything mixed together and blended together. And you know, I get that we're not there and we're far from there. I I just I, I I would hate. It's like I don't want it to go in any one extreme direction. And right now, it's too extreme of white rich men. So yeah, we got to we got to change it up. So for for all the organizations, anybody that's listening to this and you know, was just sort of fascinated by the conversation, but doesn't feel like it applies to them. If your board, look at your board, if your board is overwhelmingly white, um, you, you have some work to do. And, and if recognizing that sort of on the face of it, if you're just thinking about, yeah, we do, but I don't even know who we'd go get, right? Uh, there's, you know, there's only, there's only so many of them to go around, right? <laughs> so are there, you know, with the, who are we going to find? There's only, they're, they're all on the boards already and they don't have, so here's, here's what I'm going to propose is that, that that is on its face, a racist statement. So if you think that the only, the only good board members of particular ethnicities are already on boards and are too busy to be on your board, um, it's because you're not looking hard enough. You need to look harder because the, what you're ostensibly saying is that, 80%, and here's, I mean, this is going to be a complicated thing, and it's probably better done with a visual, but if, if your board is 80% white, what you're saying, in effect, is that white people are 80% better than anybody else at being on your board. That's what you've decided. 
Um, and, and what I would say is if, if you are of the opinion that on average, if you take a group of people on average and you say that they are all on average have the same capabilities, then that means there's untapped resources in every single one of those corners, every single one of those combinations of ethnicity and gender and gender identity and disability and everything else, that, that that's where you should be actively searching out board members, because I guarantee you there's an 80% chance based on that 80% of your board being white, an 80% chance now that they're smarter and better equipped than the people that are currently on your board. So, so that's, that's the takeaway, which is if you didn't think that this necessarily applied to you, um, look at the racial makeup, look at the gender makeup, look at the gender identity makeup of your board and actively court people that meet those requirements. I would love to see more nonprofit boards actually just literally take the demographics of you know, have a snapshot of this community and like put it up on their wall or some visual as they're thinking through their board recruitment strategy, right? And, you know, you look at this percent is, you know, this is is Hispanic, this percent is Asian, this percent is, is Black, is that, you know, like whatever, like, so how do we start to reflect our community a bit more on our board? Like how powerful, and, and you mentioned, you know, the whole other, I mean, I realize it can, it can feel to someone who's never thought like this, it can feel overwhelming. And yet it's an imperative in my opinion, like how do we really become, how do we solve some of these social issues and social ills unless we start to think differently? Yeah, and if you're, if you're a board member and you're listening, you can even be stealthy about it. You don't have to, you don't have to make it overt that this is, you know, because inevitably you're going to offend some of the other racists on your board, right? You don't have to be overt about, we need to do this. Instead, go find somebody, go find somebody and recommend them to the board. Um, Do your homework, talk to people, find out who, who might be interested in your mission, who might be a good fit for you and go chase them down and, and see if they're interested. Um, and that's 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 one way that you can kind of get beyond the the sort of fraught nasal gazing nonsense that you're going to go through if you try to come up with a matrix with the entire board in the room, which is going to inevitably, you know, offend some old lady somewhere. I, I do think, though, I think there is this risk that happens with with boards who are unexperienced and or inexperienced in this. I think there is a risk of box checking. And I also just really want to caution people against that. And I think a matrix is a tool to help you look at the bigger picture. So, okay, you need such and such specialty or such and such industry represented. Okay, well, how is it? Yes, we want to get that industry and that expertise and someone in that industry and expertise who represents X you know, group or X race. And, you know, I, I just, I think there is, I think it needs to be not like this singular, like let's cherry pick and oh great. We have, (laughs) we have this specific type now and we can check it off our list. It's like, that's going to be a really bad experience for that person and really not just healthy for anybody. So, so how do you truly make this, you know, strategic in a way that it's, it's being able to help you think through multiple needs you have and how you find people in diverse communities that have the expertise and, and connections and other things you need as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's a, it's a much bigger conversation than one that we're capable of having. Yes. Um, because there's the, the challenge is that you, with the matrix, and I agree that matrixes are good because you need to know what you've got and what you've done, what you don't have, and 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 that that helps you think about all of the things that you might need, and then and then helps you kind of target and prioritize. The challenge is is that you've you then you've put yourself in a box already, is that you're looking for a, somebody who's left-handed and has green eyes and lives in the northwestern part of the state. Right. And then and so or or you're looking for somebody that works for a particular corporation. Right. Which means that you're using then they've selected all of the people that work for their organization. And they're probably overwhelmingly of one category just because that's, you know, people hire like. 
um, it, it gets it gets really complicated and really hard. And I, I don't know that. I mean, I'd love to I'd love to hear from somebody who has some some good ideas about how to do this in an intelligent way that that doesn't continue to make the same mistakes that we've made over and over again. I, I don't, but I don't I don't know even who that would be. If you know somebody, listeners, let us know. We will drag them in and make them talk to us. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of Nonprofit Everything. Just a reminder, this only works if you send us questions. So find us on Facebook, on the Nonprofit Everything webpage. You can reach out to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. Get in touch with us, ask us the questions, and we would be delighted to answer them for you. Thanks again, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm.